and uh, thank you all for joining me. I know, it, I know we're getting to the tail end of the day. We're not that far from beer, so that, that can be a good thing. Uh, or other beverages, should they be your choice. Who here was at my first session this morning? Um, victims, raise your hands. I mean, uh, the joyful attendees. Okay, so the, uh, you might see a little bit of recap at the beginning. Stick with me, we're gonna get into, we'll get into some, uh, some additional fun stuff as well. Uh, but we're gonna talk about moving up the monitoring stack. And I'd like to kind of just start out and get an idea. Who here has run some sort of monitoring system or had to define some sort of metrics in an operating environment, right? The majority of us. And therefore, we all have had some experience that's going to relate to how well we run services in our environments. And that is an extremely valuable bit of knowledge, bit of context, bit of understanding that we don't want to lose as we start moving into a cloud world where we have stuff running in PaaS services or functions as a service or stuff running in containers. When we start to move our applications into the cloud or even, even if we're running on IaaS, now we're running on shared hardware that we may not have as much insight into, we still wanna bring and, and take advantage of all that context that we built in monitoring and, and managing systems with us. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some techniques for how we, can, uh, how we can approach that and kind of do a little thought exercise as far as how we can start applying the knowledge that we've, this, that hard won, hard fought knowledge from being paged in the middle of the night and spending weekends remediating issues um, and apply that to our software and services as we start to move into the cloud. So today we have a path for monitoring things. And we normally have to, you know, we normally start with some questions. You know, why are we monitoring something? What are we gonna monitor and how are we gonna monitor it? And in a traditional IT operations environment, we care about infrastructure. And we care about, you know, hey, is maybe the, is, an, is the application getting served out of IIS? Are the services running? My event logs filling up with stuff. Right, and we, we monitor all of the things around a lot of the services that we manage. Some of us still have, some of us get some insight into what the application's doing, but usually we have to infer from what, what's happening around it. Well, there's a couple of movements happening in the industry today. This morning I talked about site reliability engineering, um, and we're at the WinOps conference, so DevOps is on top of everybody's mind, and so we're gonna take a little page from the book, uh, from, a, uh, from the DevOps book and the Site Reliability Engineering book um, and apply you know, the lens of Site Reliability Engineering to how we're gonna go about monitoring systems. And then we're gonna take a look at how we take our traditional experience, our typical experience, our background, and apply it and help actually improve the output of building things like service level indicators and service level objectives. So uh, for the folks who are here this morning, we have a little recap and definition, but we're gonna just breeze through this real quick to level set everybody. Site reliability engineering is an engineering discipline dedicated to helping organizations sustainably achieve the appropriate level of reliability in their systems, services, and products. There's three crucial words here. Engineering, appropriate, and reliability. And when it comes down to it, right, we want to make sure that the level of, our targeted level of availability is not more than what we need. It's the right, it's the right level, but it's also not less than what we need. If you're building medical products or you're building systems that fly planes, right, especially if you build systems that fly planes, because I have to fly in them regularly, I would appreciate if, if they were very highly reliable. Um, and my family would too, so. Uh, but very often we get, well, we, we need it to be always available. And that may not be what we really want to get out of the system. That may not be the actual requirement. It's just what people, ex people feel they, they should expect. 
right? I pay you, you're, you're, the, you're the technical professional, it should just work. Well, in order to have reasonable discussions about this stuff, we need to put some numbers and metrics behind it and then be able to tie those things to dollars. And this is kind of where, uh, uh, dollars and people time and things like that, because that is how we have rational discussions in, in our businesses. So, why might we monitor? Right. First of all, are my apps and infrastructure behaving and doing what I expect them to be doing? Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? I have a certain expectation because of my role in the company. I expect them to behave a certain way. But you know what? Other people may have different expectations. I may think it's perfectly, it's perfectly fine that the website takes a couple of seconds to load. My users may not feel that way because they have to keep going to that page for things in their job, right? I test it once and it's fine, but if they have to work with it all day, that may be unacceptable, right? And what are the goals we have for the systems that we're serving? One of the big differences in how we tr have traditionally and, and more typically uh, looked at monitoring our infrastructure is we really have to look at, at not just the infrastructure but the services that the infrastructure is providing. Right? And, and it may sound like a broken record with this, but at our infrastructure is a core part of the service that we're providing, but it's still a part of the service that we are providing. And the service that we are providing is the thing that drives value for our organization. And we also want to watch for change, right? As we monitor things, we start to build baselines and we start to understand what a typical day or a typical Monday or a typical week or part of the year looks like for our systems. And when we see deviation from that, that may indicate that we have some problem. It may be a problem with the infrastructure, it may be a problem with demand, it may be a problem, or it may be a really good thing. It may be hey, guess what, it's Black Friday and we're gonna do a lot of sales. So we have a little uh, hierarchy, uh, similar to a hierarchy of needs, we have our hierarchy of reliability. And as we focus on building reliable systems, monitoring is what we base everything on. Now, this, you may notice a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of talks around DevOps they'll focus on your CI, CD pipeline as your baseline. When we start, when we have the conversation more in the site reliability space, we're gonna start and talk about monitoring. That is our foundational, kind of our foundational capability, our ability to respond to incidents, of which we can do postmortems and, and add new tests and do our capacity planning, new development and user experience. All of those things depend on our ability to get data out of our systems about how they are running. And what is that data that we're getting? It's service level indicators. The service level indicators are metrics that we have converted into some sort of percentage. In order for us to think about you know, what are the things that I might, cons my, I might turn into service level indicators, there are a couple of ideas. And my coworker David made this nice little V. And I'm just gonna fill it in because I'm not gonna walk through every single one of these things. You all can read just as well as I can. But as you're deciding what metrics matter and what are, what are the objectives that we're trying to reach, keeping these words in mind start to focus what the things are that we care about. But there's another angle to this. It's not just our perception of the system, but it's the, it's the user of the system that we have to make sure we take into account. So SLIs, or service level indicators, they're a proportion, or a ratio the number of successful HTTP calls over the number of HTTP calls total. 
successful operations or operations in a certain period of time over the total number, right? Or something like number of fully qu full quality responses. What's full qu quality response? Well, we might have to go talk to somebody to figure out what that is, right? It, it's probably going to be somebody uh, who's one of the business uh, partners who gets some value from this application. Right? What's a quality response look like? Now, personally, I got into computers because I don't like people, and I wanted to work with computers because I could you know, make them do things, and I didn't really have to justify why. They would just, they would behave, right? And, and working with people, I have to convince them of things, I have to come up with reasons or write papers or, um, or, or go around and, and, and talk and convince people of things. I'm an introvert by nature, and that's a lot of work. Well, unfortunately, I found out that in order to be effective in, in, uh, in the IT space, I had to go and start talking to people and working with, working with partners in sales and marketing and in development and other areas of the business, right? And then, but learning to do so provided a lot of opportunities and opened a lot of doors. So stepping out and being able to find, can we measure what full quality responses are and provide that metric? Now all of a sudden I'm providing something of value to other parts of the organization and they are now not seeing me as the digital janitor who just makes sure that the computers come on in, in, during the day, but somebody who is a partner with them, helping them surface information that's going to show the value of the systems that we have and where we should focus our, our next efforts. Right? And we can come up with many, many other types of, uh, uh, types of, uh, types of other metrics and SLIs, but we express them as ratios or percentages, right? Now, there's another component to the service level indicator, and that's the how, right? We wanna be explicit about where we're gonna get these metrics from, because there's a, mul there's a multitude of places. I could get my successful HTTP calls, and wow, again, this, I should have changed this during the breaks. Um, I did not, so I will, re uh, I will read it out because this is not gonna display well. But I can get the successful number of HTTP calls at the load balancer. Or I can see as measured by the client for the number of operations completed in time. Or from the server logs for the number of quality responses. Or number of records processed by some thick client application. Determining where I take that metric from is going to influence what value we get from that. Measured by the client versus measured at the load balancer is going to, inf you know, I'm going to say what I care about and what I don't. If I'm measuring at the load balancer, I may not care about the state of the internet connection in front of that or the network connection in front of that. If I'm talking about from the client, now I'm starting to care about some of that. Like if their phone, if they're trying to do a request off their phone and they run out and they're out of service and the client buffers some metrics to pass along, I'm caring about the quality of their network connection. So none of those is particularly wrong or, or, or more correct, but they're conversations to be had. All right, and it is the latter part of the day. I didn't warn anybody that there'd be math, so it's okay. And I remember back in grade school, my teacher would always say, you need to show your work because you're not gonna walk around with a calculator all the time. And I put my phone in my bag so I can't wave it up here, but guess what, Mrs. Smith? Ha <laughs> ha, I do, so I don't have to remember math. Well, we'll do a little bit. We'll make it easy. We're not gonna do any calculus or anything like that. Probably because I don't remember it from high school. All right, <laughs> so if 
I have 50 successful HTTP calls out of 100, that gives me 50% availability. And now that I've wowed you with my math prowess, where did those numbers come from? Right, this is that discussion I was just talking about. There are a lot of places that we can potentially get these type of numbers from, and each place that we get them from is going to have different trade-offs. All of them, though, require me to trust that data. If that data is coming in and is inaccurate, and I have to make a mental decision about, I trust that data, but not that data, I have now pretty much undermined all of the potential conclusions that I can come from, from, this, from these metrics and this data. Then we have service level objectives. And we're gonna focus on the objective portion of this, right? When we create these service level objectives, which is basically how, what, what thresholds we put around our service level indicators, we wanna start with what the users care about. And we come at it from that perspective. Not necessarily what I care about. We're gonna work back from where the user's perspective is, right? If we work from the desired behaviors back to the specific indicators for that, that makes it a lot easier to say, uh, and to, and to um, you know, deal with the, it has to be up all the time. Well, if the users really only expect it to be up about 80% of the time, then anything more than that is gonna end up being wasted effort and money and things like that. But we can't have that discussion until we actually figure out what are the things that our, user, our users are gonna care about, or the, at least the proxies for our user are gonna care about. So the basic service level objective recipe starts with the thing. The thing that we care about. It could be HTTP requests. It could be storage checks, operations. And just like I talked about here with service level indicators, this is our service level indicator. We have the thing and the context in which we're gonna gather it. So we're gonna get these from the load balancer. And then we're gonna say how much, what, what we qualify success as, right? That we want at least 90% of these things to succeed. And then we add some time bounding to it. So over the next 30 days, I wanna, or over the last 30 days, I wanna see 90% metrics, 90% uh, success. These time bounds are also important because they allow us then to define the window for stability that we care about. If I had a major event happen that can impact these numbers for a, number, a period, a large period of days, right, that might, if our service level objectives keep us from deploying to production because we're out of our error budget or whatever, the longer that window is, the more impactful it could be potentially but it also could color what the behavior is now. Maybe it's been super stable over the last two weeks. Maybe it'd be perfectly safe to go do stuff now. But because we had this large incident before, it's impacting our, our capabilities. So, so understanding that there's trade-offs in the windows that we pick. All right, those of you who were in the first session, don't get to guess what this is. Actually, I'm not gonna make you guess. We're late enough in the day. But this is a PHP error. I like to throw one in every now and again because it's fun making people guess what a white screen is. Or it could be I forgot to color in the slide. But we'll, go, we'll get right past that. What we're actually gonna look at is just a quick little visualization is I set my service level objective I monitor that over time, and then I get to decide based on, if I'm, based on the results coming out of my monitoring whether things are good or things are normal. 
what, not even a chuckle out of normal for things burning down? Y'all are rough. All right, we can also make our SLOs more complex. They don't have to be the one metric. One metric may not be the right thing to represent my, my objective. It may be a combination of things like the amount of reads, right, in, in a certain percent, in, in certain tolerances, right? I can segment them off by percentages. So we're gonna go back and say, where can some of these numbers come from, right? We start with our customer expectations and customers, customer, user, whatever word we wanna put there, right? Internal or external customers. The person consuming our service. Some other data. This could be coming out of some other upstream service based on the results of, th of transactions that happen in ours and the one that we're runs what we're responsible for. And we expect our data to stay current, and we wanna watch out for, for some of the out-of-the-box metrics that are, are hard to relate to the service that we're, that we're delivering. Now we're gonna start getting, though, into how do I go from I'm monitoring for CPU and disk queue and memory pressure and all that kind of fun stuff to number of successful, fully qualified responses, right? How, how, do I, how do I take and bring those kind of metrics back and forth, right? Well, our traditional metrics just don't work as well. But the context that we've built about our services does. And that context is going to help as we're defining these service level objectives for, for our environments to be able to tie the things that when the service level indicators go out of tolerance, what our responses are. So we're gonna go back and, you know, guess what? We have to work with people in defining these metrics. And because we're working with other people in defining these metrics, they're not gonna be just the things we care about because sometimes all I do care about is CPU utilization because that's gonna, that's gonna tell me when we need to move to newer machines with faster processors, or we need to start buying more servers so that we can deploy the new versions of things out into those, right? Um, that type of information can be great, but it's not the things that we should be caring about in this context. So we need to work with others in IT, in development, and our, and our other partners across our business or our organizations in order to figure out what are the things that we really do need to care about, either contractually or in, in user experience to deliver our service. And, and reliability is part of the user experience. So we bring our context. Over time, for example, I, I worked a few years ago at Stack Overflow. And we ran, for the most part, on all physical hardware. And I could tell you from looking at our, at our monitoring dashboard if things were running properly. If I looked at the CPU utilization, memory pressure, uh, disk queues, all that, kind, all that kind of fun stuff, network, network weights and stuff like that, I can tell you if there's anything funky in the environment. Now, people who had worked there longer than I could could tell you from looking at a couple of those stats even more context about what might be wrong. Like when we were running a pre-release of like, I think it was SQL 2014, get a phone call on a Sunday. Hey, Steve, uh, SQL Server doesn't look very happy. It's running at 70% CPU right now. What? It normally runs about 30%, and it normally runs less on a Sunday because that's one of the slower days. If it's running at 70% now, we're not gonna survive Monday. So we had to try to figure out what's wrong. Well, obviously, you know, something's wrong with the plan cache 
because it seems to be recomputing all of the all of the SQL queries all the time. Which then led us into a little bit of troubleshooting and opening up a support ticket and thanks to some successful mitigation steps, we were able to survive Monday, but we were on a support call for several days after until we could, were able to get a fix for that particular problem. And without having built that context up about the inv operating environment and being able to look at like one metric and, in, and kind of inf start to infer some of the potential problems that were happening in the application environment, if, if that person had not looked at the dashboard that day, Monday would have been a really bad day because we, we weren't out of tolerance on our monitoring system and, that, and even if we were, it, it would have required somebody with that particular context to understand where the, where the potential problem point was, otherwise we would have had a lot of other troubleshooting to go do. So as we identify the different metrics and the service level indicators that we want to use, we can use that experience that we built up, that context, that, oh, hey, guess what? The web tier is running at 40 or 50 percent. Something changed in the code base recently. Or maybe, there, maybe there's something else running on these servers. Maybe it's only running on two servers. No, maybe something's wrong with those servers. Oh, guess what? There's a hardware problem there. Right? Understanding where we see these behavior states come from help us then identify potential remediation steps for when we fall out of tolerance in our service level indicators and objectives. And being able to tie those things together then puts us in a place where when we run in an environment like a PaaS service or in a container in a cloud or in a VM in the cloud where we can't really see what's happening on the hardware, puts us in a much better place to effectively operate our software. Because guess what, if you tell me how many fully qualified requests are coming through, that gives me no troubleshooting information, right? So our context, we can make sure that included in these service level indicators and objectives are the metrics that we need to be able to effectively troubleshoot problems, as well as the, as well as the metrics and, and data that our developers need to tr deal with application code issues. So, let's give you a quick little scenario, kind of a little thought exercise. When we have an application server that's running at over 80% CPU and the page file swapping heavily. This is a server that normally runs about 30 or 40% CPU utilization, that would be a standard workload. We start to receive complaints on slow response and application hangs from the user. But there's nothing in the error logs. And the web server is showing successful requests and responses. Now, not knowing anything else about this, what are some questions that I might ask? Right? And what might those questions, what might the answers to those questions help us determine? And when this happens, will I have that information to answer those questions? Things like, what do those metrics tell me about the application behavior? The client, if I'm measuring errors at the client side, I'm probably getting some error metrics from them because they're saying that they're getting some errors and a lot of latency. But my application server thinks everything's fine. So if I was monitoring at the load balancer or at the web server, probably everything's cool. But one thing we might be able to infer about the application behavior is that when, the, when that server is under heavy load, the application, perform, the application performance may slow down to a tolerable level for the application server code, but not the client. Maybe we need to think about some timeouts, right? What, what mitigation might we consider based on the behavior that we're seeing? Maybe we wanna, we wanna have the client 
submit a timeout parameter and, and or maybe we want the client not to block when it submits that request and do it in a more async fashion. But we can provide some context like, hey, I'm not seeing any problem on the server side. Everything's running okay. I'm not seeing disk queuing backing up. So it's not, it's not latency waiting for something on, on disk. There's no network queuing, so we're not waiting for outbound or inbound requests, right? It's all processor bound. So there's some process that, that is, that's, causing, that's causing this. So how can I deal with this latency? Now, if I don't have accurate views into what the CPU utilization actually is, how would I troubleshoot this kind of an issue, right? If I'm not running on my own hardware, or I'm not running on my own uh, virtualization infrastructure where I actually have an idea of what the hardware is underneath. If I'm running an Azure app service or something like that, how do I troubleshoot that? How would I know what, what that, what that uh, bounding looks like? Right? Maybe we measure the time from the request to the response and we come up with an acceptable threshold. And when we start hitting that threshold, we scale the service. Or we, or we bring in more tiers, uh, we bring in more servers behind the load balancer. How about y'all? Any other ideas? I know it's the end of the day and I'm asking you for a response. But I'm hopeful. Deploy a new version of the application, right? May, maybe there's a performance issue that's that's been fixed, and we can and we can get that out. Great. Other ideas. Turn it off and on again. Love it, right? Um, yeah, stop, recycle the application, you know, something like that. There's a, there, there's a number of different techniques and things that we've tried over our careers, working with different applications in different environments. And we bring those then to, because at, when it boils down to it, right, when you get an alert on a particular metric, there needs to be something you can go and do with it. Otherwise, the alert doesn't really do anything for you. And so as we look at these service level indicators and when something falls out of tolerance, what am I supposed to do with it? And we bring that context. We bring a lot of that context. Yes, the application developers can bring some of that as well, but we bring a lot of that context from running software in production. And so there's a ton of value that we have to bring forward regardless of the application environment that we run in. You know, uh, some, a lot of times I hear, well, hey, if, if we move into the cloud, all they want to do is move away from the VMs and onto like PaaS services or containers and things like that, and so then what am I going to go do? There's plenty to go do, and it does not change the fact that we still have to operate our software. We may have to change a little bit of what we do, we may have to change our mindset a little bit, but there is a ton of value and expertise sitting in this audience right here in the crowd in this, in this conference right here. And all of us bring that, bring, can bring that value forward and make our applications and our environments more ready to move into the cloud and be, and, and be successful in doing so. So with that, Got a couple of uh, resources to point you at for some additional reading or fun stuff to go watch or run through in Microsoft Learn. These may look familiar. Took a lot of ideas from site reliability engineering in this talk. And so there's some fun reading and how to's and then also some more commentary in the last one. But we also had a handful of sessions that uh, on SRE at, at uh, Ignite this year. And in those, one of the sessions was on uh, when DevOps and SR, uh, incident response, when DevOps and, and site reliability engineering collide. And we, they talked some about these metrics and how 
um, and, and how incident response and stuff works, which is a very nice follow on to, okay, I've started to monitor things. What happens when things go wrong? So it's a good talk to go watch. We've started to create some SRE content on Microsoft Learn, which is our, on, which is our new online learning platform. In addition to SRE content, there's a ton of things if you want to go learn all the Azure stuff. I highly encourage it. And there's fun badges. And last but not least, find me. Find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, which I don't have up there, um, all the places. And I'm happy to continue the conversation. And if you have any questions, I have a handful of extra minutes before they need to shuffle me off so that they can get the real voices and experiences up here for the panel. Feel free to make up a question. Or I'll, I'll just start talking about my family. <laughs> yes. So we, we outsource our infrastructure to uh, the public cloud providers, uh, so we don't need to run the hardware. Yep. Can we outsource our monitoring to things like a, a SOC as a service or a network operation center as a service, that kind of thing? So you can sort of. Um, the, the challenge there becomes who's defining the metrics that you're capturing, right? And so if you, have some, if you have someone who is instrumenting your code for you, it might be a little weird, because uh, a lot of this stuff tends to fall out of instrumenting the code. Now, if you, if you have a service provider that's, that's, you know, you provide an application, and they're gonna run it on their platform, and that platform captures a bunch of metrics and things for you, you should have those, whatever those go to, you should be able to define the queries and alerts and things around that. If you have them do that under your direction, maybe. Uh, the, challenge, the challenge when we start talking about outsourcing stuff comes into what happens when it needs to change significantly, right? And, and, can, and will your outsourcing agreement keep your outsourcer's incentives in line with yours? You can have very successful outsourcing relationships as long as the incentives are aligned. And when, my, and when my business's incentives change, I need to be able to change the relationship, right, to, to, keep those, to keep those things in line. Otherwise, now I'm competing against that tie. I'm, I'm, I have to work against that tie, right? Um, very often, it was about, uh, very often these type of agreements are around controlling costs and, and well-known delivery plans versus agility and responsiveness. And, uh, and so now when people start getting into like, hey, I wanna do things faster and I wanna, do th and I wanna try more things and, and different platforms and OS versions and all of our agreements are locked in this ironclad rigidity to control cost and ensure predictability, we, we, begin, we, we start fighting against those things because we just learned all of a sudden, oh, hey, but going fast can also lead to stability. And that also then allows me to respond to the market in time. So outsourcing is not necessarily a problem. Outsourcing contracts can definitely be a problem. Other questions? That was a great question, actually. Um, and uh, just worth uh, a little, little bit of extra reading on that. The uh, Accelerate State of DevOps report has a, uh, a whole set of findings this year on, uh, on, on outsourcing, and in particular on functional outsourcing and the different models for outsourcing. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's well worth a read yep. uh, for outsourcing relationships that work versus those that might be slightly more challenged when you uh, want to move at pace. Um, sorry, I can't see anyone here. I've got a light in my face. <laughs> Any more questions from anyone? Everyone's a little tired, aren't we? Well, yeah. we can just what. pass the plate now, right? <laughs> like, a, <laughs> take up a little collection real quick. No. Little, little collection, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any any tips for the speakers? Yeah. <laughs>
All right. Look, guys, well, we've got we've got about um, probably about three minutes, uh, and then we've got the panel session in here. So we do have time for another question. If anybody uh, thinks of anything last minute, we could do that. Um, otherwise, uh, I think everybody from downstairs will be gradually making their way up here as the, the talks finish down there, and then we've got the uh, the panel Q and A for the last forty five minutes, and then we have beer. Um, so if you want to take uh, three minutes for a, for a bathroom break or grab some water or whatever because you've got another another 45 minutes of a panel session, then, uh, then now's probably a good time to do so, uh, unless we have any, any final questions. But uh, so, all right, um, thank you. Thank you to Stephen. Thank you for your, uh, your second, second talk. That was awesome. Thanks very much. Thank you all. And thanks for sticking it through to the last session before the panel. You all are awesome. <laughs>